noon Eastern. <laughs> and it's is, 11 Dallas time. <laughs> 11 Dallas time. <laughs> so thank you guys so much for being here today um, for this discussion with Cindy Matthews and Mark Wingfield. Um, I'm so excited to be hearing from the both of you. This is the fourth um, session that Cindy has participated in with this virtual event series, Cult Recovery Not Canceled. Um, and I'm just so glad and thankful that you've been um, willing to give up so much of your time to help participate and also help other speakers participate as well from the Dallas conference. Um, I think that's brilliant. And I'm really excited to hear more about your topic today. Um, just some you know, ground rules for everybody who's tuning in. We will be locking the meeting in about 10 minutes um, to just prevent anyone from coming in who shouldn't be in. We wanna create a safe atmosphere for you guys and do what we can as much as possible. Also, we will be disabling all chat for this meeting, but you do have the option to ask questions via the Q&A box. So please ask questions at any time, and I will help moderate at the very end of the meeting today, and we'll ask Cindy and Mark the questions. So again, thank you all for tuning in. I will go ahead and turn the time over to Cindy and Mark, and if you guys could briefly introduce yourself. Sure. Um, and it's a little bit selfish on my end to be doing these four sessions because the Dallas camp conference was rescheduled for September, October, and I want to keep the interest up in what we're doing and, and what, what we're um, trying to achieve through the Dallas conference. So I've been interviewing different uh, participants that we had scheduled to speak. And um, Mark here is, is fabulous, and we were so excited to hear him speak. But just a quick introduction for myself. Um, I'm Dr. Cindy Matthews. I live in Dallas. I teach as a counselor educator in the graduate counseling program. I think I'm called an assistant clinical associate or professor. I don't know what I am. I'm something. And I have a private practice in uh, Garland, Texas, and I work with domestic violence. I work with religious uh, abuse. I work with um, any kind of trauma, complex trauma in seeing my practitioners. And one of the things I'm really excited about talking with Mark is as a theologian, as a pastor, I, I really think these conversations need to happen more. Healers from a spiritual realm, healers from the, you know, kind of scientific counseling realm so that we can be working together in helping heal people because we have the same kind of goal. But go ahead and introduce yourself, Mark. Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Mark Wingfield. I'm the associate pastor at Wilshire Baptist Church here in Dallas, um, a role I have been in for 16 and a half years. And I was a journalist for 21 years before that. Uh, so uh, diverse experience. And Wilshire is what I would call a progressive uh, Baptist uh, church. Theologically, uh, we are fully inclusive uh, of LGBTQ uh, community. And that's actually the topic of the book that I've most recently written that we'll talk about, I'm sure. Um, and along the way, I've become uh, an ally of the transgender community, and we'll talk about that too. Uh, so really excited to be here with you today. Well, and the other thing is this uh, is being recorded. So if uh, anyone here wants a copy of it, or it'll be on YouTube next week. So Mark, if you want to share it with your right. prisoners or, or other things. So because they, I guess they're going to be locking the meeting to prevent Zoom bombing in about 10 minutes. I guess we had a bunch of Zoom bombers yesterday. So Mark, first of all, what just really stood out to me is you said progressive Baptist in the same sentence, <laughs> <laughs> which I kind of went, what? <laughs> raise my eyebrows and tell me I, I want to hear your story and I want to hear what you're doing with your parishioners do you call them parishioners what do you call them yeah yeah that's fine parishioners congregants congregants members, yeah whatever what, what you're doing for COVID what made made your church different I want to talk about the transgender community I've got I've got a lot of questions sure. but it, help me understand progressive Baptist really what is that, right <laughs> Well, so I think uh, in the United States, there's a monolithic impression that Baptists are all conservative uh, evangelicals. And I would describe myself as a not conservative evangelical. Uh, there are more of us than you realize who still um, adhere to uh, the scriptures and haven't thrown uh, that out, but believe there's a, a generous way to read and interpret scriptures that is not a literal reading that, uh, that you get in fundamentalism. So one of the interesting things that happens here in Dallas is we often get portrayed as the anti-First Baptist Dallas church. So 
you know, Robert Jeffress uh, downtown is on Fox News all the time and uh, doing doing stuff. And we're sort of the opposite end of the spectrum, uh, the, the, the counterweight uh, to that, if you will. So we have ordained women uh, into ministry since 1991. Uh, we have been inclusive of uh, divorced persons in leadership since 1991. Uh, so that, that's a long time ago in Baptist life uh, for this. Uh, I would describe us as a church that uh, wants to be exceedingly generous in our, uh, the way we live our lives and the way we interpret scripture and the, the kind of hospitality that we feel like we're called to give uh, to the community. And so we're very involved in community uh, social action as well. We have an emphasis on um, social justice here. We're very involved in interfaith uh, work, interdenominational and interfaith work, uh, very strong relationships. Uh, with the Jewish community, the Muslim community uh, here in Dallas that we um, are actively involved in. A lot of social action in working with homelessness and hunger issues and uh, advocating against payday lending, advocating for public education, uh, and so forth. Uh, so those are some hallmarks of, of who we are. We actually were founded as a uh, Southern Baptist church in 1951 but we left the Southern Baptist Convention in the year 2000, mm -hmm. uh, just through the natural progression of them becoming more to the right and us not uh, mm. uh, along okay. the way. So that's a brief history. So that, that's definitely more pro progressive. Um, I'm, I'm new, well, new to the South here, the Bible Belt, and so it, it kind of surprised me when you say <laughs> because one of, of what I like see. To, uh, one of our slogans we use around here is, we're a different kind of Baptist church. Ah. You know, and by that, we mean that when you hear Baptist church, you think a certain thing. Yeah. But typically, we're not that. Well, and, and down here in Dallas, uh, down here, I'm from Canada, so I think of it as down here. <laughs> but uh, yeah, think of the Jeffries, is that his name? The yeah. one Jeffers? Jeffers, yeah, you, you kind of think of um, him down here. So several people were um, surprised, amazed question me when I was saying, hey, I think we need to include some religious people in this conversation about spiritual abuse because they have been the abusers. And I wanted to make sure that there was an understanding of not all are. As a matter of fact, some are very healing. And your name uh, came up as one of the first people to, to talk about creating a healing environment in church, um, pastoral healing kind of thing. Um, so first of all, I want to know what you think spiritual abuse is. Um, you know, I, I speak from a mental health perspective. You yeah. speak from the other perspective, the other, <laughs> the, the pastoral perspective. So how do you see spiritual abuse? And, and kind of tell us what you think the effects are, and what happens with that. Uh, lovely. So for a long time, for as long as I've been affiliated with this church, which is 21 years, and certainly before that, uh, Wilshire has been the kind of church where people come to heal. From all sorts of abuses. Uh, we, we are the kind of church where people come when they are beat up and battered uh, emotionally, spiritually, whatever, and find healing. And in a best case scenario, you get patched up and you go out and help other people. Uh, I can tell you a specific story about that if, if, down the line. But I think um, we have seen through our work that a lot of people, a lot of people, have uh, silently been abused by fundamentalism, uh, whether that be in a Baptist church or a Mormon church or in a Catholic church or in Islam or whatever. The, whoops, my lights just went out. Hang on. If I wave my hand, there we go. <laughs> Someone didn't like what I was saying. Okay, there you go. <laughs> Still here and the, the automatic light went up. So there is this, this kind of spiritual abuse that happens through restriction. Uh, mm -hmm when you grow up or you are um, trapped in some sort of spiritual system, uh, whether it be a church or a cult or whatever, right? Uh, and that's an interesting distinction between those two. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, when you're trapped in that kind of system and you don't really understand that you're being abused, but you're being restricted uh, in certain ways and you're not allowed to think for yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, one of my favorite stories, we had a family leave our church a few years ago who'd been here a long time. And the, the, they had young children, you know, like high school, junior high kids. And the, the father in this family, as they were leaving, said to our senior pastor, who does most of the preaching here, uh, 
you know, I have to, I have to think uh, every day at work during the week. And when I come to church, your sermons make me think, and I just really don't want to have to think that much on Sunday. Mm. And so uh, we are a thinking kind of church. We expect mm-hmm. you to bring your brain and don't check it at the door. Mm-hmm. Because if you can't think and ask a question about what we're doing, what are we saying, uh, then that's not right. You know, it's, it's, it's not that the, the, the church is the final authority and arbiter on all things. Uh, one of the wonderful doctrines uh, in Baptist theology that's been thrown out by so many of our Baptist colleagues is called the priesthood of all believers. And that is, we believe that uh, in authentic fashion, you as a congregant, you as someone who follows uh, Christ in, in your life, you ought to be able to interpret scripture and understand God's work uh, with you individually as, as a part of the community, but you don't have to rely on me as a pastor to tell you what God's will for your life is. And that's really interesting because when I grew up in the church I was in, it was very much check your brain at the door, uh, listen to um, what everybody else is saying out there, right. uh, you, the authority. Um, you don't have a right to have an opinion. You don't have a right to voice whatever is going on. You just have to follow. So that's very different. And, and that's exactly what the restrictive religion is. Um, and FYI, um, 43 years, I was in a very restrictive fundamentalist religion. Uh, which, yeah, it was very conditional in terms of I had to do this, I had to be this in order to be accepted by God. So, you know, someone like you can be very triggering for me just in the role that you are in. Right. So I want to pick up on that because th- one of the things I think we see in a lot of uh, spiritual abuse in organized religion is something I call um, transactional faith. Uh, that is, uh, if you do this thing for God, God will do this thing for you. Mm-hmm. And it's like a vending machine kind right. of thing. Uh, and this, this language gets carried over into the revivalism of Christianity through things like, um, it, you know, you'll hear an old timey preacher say, well, I need to go do some business with God or uh, use some sort of transactional language about uh, being held accountable uh, in, in, in such a way that seems like, you know, you're exchanging something. You're, it's mm-hmm. a kind of deal mm-hmm. and i think that transcends a lot of religions uh, but is a sign of uh, certainly a danger that we want to help people get away from this is this is not I, I i see faith not as a transaction but as a relationship uh and as a lifelong uh experience that is generous and generative both uh not trying to tell me what i can't do so much as telling me what i should do to live at peace with other people uh, in the world and to be part of the of the community, the global mm-hmm. community, not just this community. Anytime we focus on just our little community of faith or whatever it be, right, uh, that's not helpful because we've got to always have the larger picture in mind. So really it sounds like you don't see yourself as, as the person who stands in the way of the relationship with a deity, but the one who kind of stands beside and helps facilitate that. Yeah. I mean, I want to be an enabler. I, I, I'm, I'm not the Pope. I'm not the Bishop. I'm not, uh, I'm not the mediator, uh, mm-hmm. I, man, that's a heavy burden to carry. Right. And that's but, one of the things I always struggled with was that I had to gain the approval of this person here, the me- mediator who, you know, was very much, I had to confess. I had to, sorry, I'm not trying to make it about my story, but they, um, they had to approve in order for God to approve. Yeah, and I, I think that's just not healthy, right? Any, any human mediator in that role. Uh, and now we're back to that question. What's the line between religion uh, and a cult, <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and that, kind, that level of control, uh, when any religious uh, figure is given that much control over someone else's life, mm-hmm. that is not healthy. Mm-hmm. So, so you would see that as kind of the spiritual abuse line of where they are controlling your relationship. With yeah, I, I mean, definitely, right? I, I, I think, uh, it, it, gosh, if you get off and looking at, um, I, I'm going to use a, a specific example here that is extreme. Mm-hmm. But if you look at um, sexual predators mm-hmm. and what happens, uh, particularly in church relationships. Yes. Uh, in every case I've known of, there is a controlling mechanism with an authority figure who says, you've got to do what I say, 
Mm -hmm. You can't tell anyone else about this thing, right? It's a very controlled thing where you are dependent upon me for this. And if you violate me in this, then you're going to have trouble with God. Mm. Uh, and so I think you're saying that sexual abuse in the pastoral relationship as a form of of spiritual abuse. Oh, absolutely. But there's but there's other kinds as well. But the sexual abuse is the extreme. Because well, I hear I a lot of people yeah. say, oh, spiritual abuse, that's sexual abuse by a pastor. What you're saying is there's a whole realm within there. Oh my goodness. Yes. You know, I'm 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 thinking of uh, several examples of my friends who are in the transgender community and th what they have experienced that's not sexual abuse you know in, in a predatory sense but it is uh, a kind of abuse about who you are as a person mm -hmm. uh, that if you want to be accepted by god you've got to be the kind of person i want you to be not mm -hmm. the kind of person you feel like god has made you to be uh, so that's restriction and i think that's abusive too particularly uh, if you're trying to um, give ultimatums uh, to people that God will only love you if mm -hmm. X, Y, or Z, right? Mm -hmm. And that's where a lot of folks have, have felt, I think, rejection from the church. Even if it's not explicitly stated, it's maybe implied. Mm -hmm. it's one of the reasons that I, I'm a big advocate that every church in America needs to right now have a conversation about sexuality, because even if you don't come down where we have uh, to be fully inclusive, you owe it to every person in your congregation and their families to let them know where they, where they stand. When they come into your church, they need to know are they welcome or not. Don't pretend they are when they're not. Mm, okay. And okay. A, a lot of churches use this vague language, oh, we love everybody. But when you get in, you realize that's, no, they don't really love everybody. You yeah. know, they, they love you if you will come in and be, try to be like, what they think you ought to be right they start using the clobber verses against lgbtq or they say women you need to be more submissive or whatever but yeah sure we love everybody as long as you do it the way we're saying that's right and that's it. not love mm -hmm. that's control yeah um so as um a pastor or preacher how do you recognize congregants um who have been abused how, how what are some of the signs that you see and what do you kind of do to work with that realizing that just you as a person, as a pastor, could be triggering. How do you work within that? So this is so hard. Uh, I, th I think, um, as with so many things, there's a spectrum. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are some people who will tell you their story up front. Mm -hmm. uh, and, I mean, there will be no question <laughs> where they're coming from, right? Because okay. they're old and they want you to know. Uh -huh. More often, there are people who carry their story deep within them. And it may take years. I, I don't mean months, I mean years. Years. Mm -hmm. uh, to be able to sort of pull that story out. Well, because their trust has been violated, so why would they bring that out? Right. And yet they're still drawn to church. Yeah. Uh, and they're still here. Uh, yeah. Maybe for the right reason, maybe for the wrong reason. Uh, but it's very hard when we don't know that that subterranean um, baggage is there because you're right, it can be triggering. And then I'm thinking of people who suddenly disappear. And they're gone for months at a time. And you think, what did I do? Mm -hmm. What did we do? Mm -hmm. Well, maybe we didn't do anything that we knew we did, right? It's just that the, the, all that stuff came up again. And so you'll have people sort of in and out mm -hmm. uh, over time or sometimes hopping from place to place, sort of mm, afraid to reveal too much of themselves. Mm -hmm. I think some of these are just classic abuse symptoms in life in general. And they show up in church in a big way because it's so uh, intimate. Uh, mm -hmm. at, at one level. So um, what kind of things do you do once you realize, oh, this has been going on? What, do you try to reach out? What, what kind of healing? Because the when we were talking about the Dallas conference, it was recognizing, um, preventing, and healing. So what kind of things do you do to, it uh, sounds like you're doing a lot of prevention work by saying this is up front who we are and this is who we are welcoming for, but also what do you do for the healing? What what do you so, do for that? Um, several things. Uh, as a pastor, I am not a therapist. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the first things I tell people is, I, I am not a therapist. <laughs> it, it, if you need to speak with a counselor uh, in a therapeutic way, I highly recommend it. Uh, and I will help you find the right person if you don't know the right person. So I mm -hmm. do a lot of referral work mm -hmm. uh, to get people connected. Uh, 
to someone like you mm. who can really help them walk through this in a professional uh, therapeutic way. Because I, first of all, we want to make no bones about the fact that uh, our pastoral work, although hopefully helpful, is not therapy. Mm. And there is a really important place for therapy uh, that we not only advocate, but participate in ourselves. Um, I, I would say the vast majority of my ministerial staff either is or has been in a therapeutic re relationship with a counselor uh, mm. uh, over time because we find value in that ourselves. Cool. Right? The, yeah. the, the burden that we, uh, that we bear is um, can't, can't be handled on our own. And so uh, I have a wonderful uh, therapist I see who I, uh, who I really highly respect and have benefited from so much. And so sometimes if you'll say to someone, this is something I do too, uh, it opens that door to say, let me help you find the right person. Well, and I'm really surprised to hear that probably because of my background. It was always the pastor heals, therapist, or, you know, that whole relationship between science and, and right. the religion of they're over here, we're over here. Um, I, I don't see a lot of that interaction of here's therapy and here's spirituality and somehow let's, let's bring this together. Oh, uh, we, yeah, we believe very strongly uh, in science in general and in medicine and the healing power of relational work. Um, we have a number of therapists in the church. In fact, we actually host uh, an office space here in the church building for, a, for another uh, therapist, uh, two therapists who work here uh, mm -hmm. on, on their own, but we provide the space because we think it's important uh, for that. And so, uh, I mean, we're, we're, we make referrals a lot. If on the other hand, there's something that we can, usually what I'll say to someone about my own ability and most of our staff would do the same is if there's something that we can talk through in one or two sessions, yeah, let's do that. But if, it, if, if this is deeper or more complex than that, we also have a wonderful uh, ministry here that a lot of churches have. It's called Stephen ministry. That is, we have lay, lay leaders who go through 50 hours of training on how to listen. Hmm. Uh, and we'll, they'll get assigned to one-on-one -on -one relationships with people who are battered or bruised in whatever way going through a life, difficult life circumstance and they'll just be a spiritual friend to them for a period of time mm -hmm. mainly you know just so that they have someone uh, to walk alongside them but they're not therapists and we say that up front too if it, you know there's there's this companionship uh to be a spiritual friend but this is not therapy and we recommend that uh, as well i hope is that helpful yeah. So if I were um, doing that church hopping, and I know when I left my original church, um, I, I, I think I was telling you 20 churches in 20 days. Right. <laughs> I was trying to figure out because I was told there is one truth. And so I was like, I'm going to find that one truth. Um, so what kind of things should I be looking for as I am? Because, you know, I, spirituality is still very important to me. Um, and, I, and I found my own personal realm for that but um if i were hurt uh ab spiritually abused or anything what should i be looking for as i'm going to i wouldn't recommend 20 churches in 20 days but i <laughs> what should i be looking for to to know that this might be a place um that i might be able to at least start looking great question uh, i i would say there's several things you can look for one is uh what is the attitude of the leadership you see is it, uh, is it authoritarian? Is it making declarative statements that you must do this, you must do that, uh, you must conform in some way? Th that's not what you really, it, anyone teaching or preaching an absolute version of uh, your behavior uh, or your beliefs that has no nuance to it, I, I think nuance is important in this too. The second thing is to look for uh, what kind of people do you see around? Uh, d is the leadership diverse in any way or is it all the same person just duplicated, right? If everyone looks and sounds the same, that's probably not a good, good thing too. And we, we're always seeking to be more diverse in our appearance and it's hard. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I, I think that are, are there women involved in leadership would be a good question. Mm -hmm. uh, is it just men? Because if it's just men, you probably don't want to be there. Uh, where I was, it was just white men. <laughs> right. So it, th those are things. And then I, th I think, um, what kind of relationships are formed there? 
Mm. And are those relationships that you witness about conformity and control, or are they about empowering you to become a better person? Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, the church that you want to be in is one that builds you up, not tears you down. Mm -hmm. And I know for someone who's been in an abusive situation, it's hard to tell the difference sometimes. Right. How, how do you victims feel like they need to be controlled? You know, uh, that's what they're accustomed to. Yeah. And that's why, churches, that's, that's why people end up in churches. I, I mean, sometimes I look at some of these other churches that are so controlling and wonder how, why does anyone go there? Right? right. Well, as you know, there are reasons that people sort of want that and, and feel like they need to be, they want black and white concrete answers. Yeah. And that's a lot of reasons that people actually go to cults or very, is they, they want answers. Life is hard. I work hard all week. I, I need to just kind of relax and exactly what you were saying at the beginning. You know, I kind of want to ch check my brain at the door so I can relax within this religious environment, but then at the same time, it can be abusive. Um, so I want to get to some of your, uh, well, let, let me ask one quick question before we um, talk about the transgender community um, and your stories there, which are so fascinating. I want, I want to hear more about that. But what are you seeing right now um, in terms of what the needs of your parishioners, your congregants are in terms of COVID? What are they reaching out for you for? What's happening there? So um, just for everyone's context, we're a large church in North Dallas, uh, not far from the SMU campus, actually. Uh, maybe a couple of miles uh, down the road, uh, in a largely affluent middle class kind of community. Uh, and I have been pleasantly shocked, actually, at how few direct needs we've had uh, coming to us in this time of crisis. Almost all of our members are, you know, sheltering at home in different ways, working from home, schooling from home, uh, doing the things that you do. Some, a, a number are healthcare workers, in fact, in our service this Sunday, uh, we've got a video segment we're doing that's uh, a report from two of our frontline healthcare workers uh, from two different hospitals here in Dallas. And one of them's working in a COVID unit at Parkland, uh, the public hospital, wow. uh, for wow. example. So we're hearing from her on what that's like uh, as well. But I expected that we would have a lot more pastoral care happening during this time with people who were sick or their family members were sick. I expected people to be dying. Uh, and thank God that's not been the case yet. Thank God. I, you know, I just don't even want to jinx that, right? Right. Uh, we're, we're very, very thankful for that. But it's, it's been different. I think what we're mainly dealing with is the anxiety of isolation, mm -hmm. anxiety of being cooped up. And I see this uh, most profoundly in two categories. The senior adults who live in senior adult communities where they have been uh, restricted to their apartments or rooms and cannot get out of those and have been there for a month. Oh, right? wow. By That's themselves, very, completely. Very restrictive. And right. so, uh, and most, most of them have some use of technology, but not all do. Uh, and so I'm, I'm thinking of one senior adult woman who isn't really able to use Zoom. Um, but I also know a 90, I, I had a Zoom conference this week on Wednesday night and uh, I had a 99 year old woman on there zooming with us. Uh, oh wow! <laughs> so he figured it out, right? Uh, with that, but this this other woman really can't, and her family has been coming to the courtyard at her complex, and she has a little balcony, and she will come out on the balcony, and they will talk to her from the courtyard to the balcony, and her grandson brought his saxophone and played for her the other day. Oh, how precious! And uh, that's all they can do. I mean, that's as close as they can get, and so that's difficult. The other, the other group that's struggling the most is uh, individuals or couples or families with young children at home. Ooh. And by that, I mean uh, preschool and early elementary, when the kids really aren't able to do the online school themselves and they've got to have help, uh, and the, the mom or dad or moms or dad, whoever, the, the parent right. figure in that case, they're trying to work from home at the same time. Yeah. And uh, they're, they're going crazy. I mean, this, the stress they are feeling. And it's very hard to figure out how to be helpful <laughs> because anything we offer might just add more stress to the situation, right? Right. So, uh, so what are you, what are you telling them? Study. <laughs> so what are you telling them? What, what kind of comfort do you give them at this time? Um, Mainly well, we're listening. You know, what's I, that? 
mainly we're listening. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I, I called uh, one of these dads the other day and uh, for a brief conversation, and, and we talked for an hour. Mm -hmm. uh, it was like he just needed another adult to talk to, right? Mm -hmm. Which I was very happy to do. So uh, one of the things we've instituted in the church during this time is something I've called the Friday Five. And we have encouraged every person in the church on Fridays, like today, to reach out and contact five other people from the church. Oh, okay. Uh, your choice. We're not going to tell you who to contact. You just, every Friday, pick five other people who are in your small group or who, are you, who you know from some, maybe who normally sit next to you in the pew. Every Friday, would you reach out to five people and just make touch with them? And this has been hugely popular and so helpful. And it's something that anyone can do. Right. So a senior adult who's trapped in an apartment somewhere, a lot of our senior adults are loving this because it, 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 it gives them something positive to do to make a difference. Right. So it's about, it's about the connection, not about the doctrine. That's right. It's about relationship. And so much of church really is about relationship. Um, and I'm going to ask you one more question about that. And then we, I, I really want to move to the transgender piece. So, um, a lot of my clients that I'm talking to right now who have been spiritually abused, their family is reaching out and saying, see, this is the last days. You're going to yeah. be destroyed. How do you kind of position that? How, um, what's happening right now with the pandemic? Because uh, they're getting a lot of kind of threatening um, emails, texts from family members. How, how, as a spiritual person, how do you kind of position that? What's happening? Well, so uh, I'll, let me give two answers. Uh, I'll, I'll give a super spiritual answer to begin with, right? <laughs> so for those who adhere to Christianity and follow the teachings of Jesus, you need to get a grip and you need to go back and read the scripture where Jesus himself says, no person knows the hour or the day. Get over it, right? Okay, I love that. <laughs> in fear, trying to figure out the last days. So if you really, if you, if, if you're someone who really believes and follows Jesus, listen to the words of Jesus, who said, don't try to figure this out. Keep living your life, right? Anything like this is idle speculation. So that, there's the spiritual answer. Okay. On a less spiritual side, uh, I would say, uh, I, I know people have been confined in family situations, particularly a lot of college students who are back home all of a sudden. And and living in more restrictive ways and other people who maybe randomly sort of ended up in a place where they <laughs> didn't think they were going to be right. right. Uh, and having to navigate, navigate those relationships. Uh, yeah. And uh, affirming homes that are really. Right. Oh yeah. I've been reading about that. Uh, certainly. So the thing I would say to anyone who's being sort of uh, assaulted by that uh, verbally is uh, think back through history. This is, this is the weirdest time of my life and probably of yours too. Yeah. But how many times have we had the talk that this is the last thing, this is the end, whatever. I mean, just go to, uh, almost every year there's something, right? And so even though this is an unusual time, there's a lot of hope that we can get through this, right? Uh, and no, this is not God's judgment on X, Y, or Z uh, any more than hurricanes or tornadoes or floods or whatever, uh, you just got to look back at that and say, those people have been wrong before. Mm. Right? They're wrong every time. Mm -hmm. Nothing new, right? And so don't fall into that fear uh, right now either, because um, I, I think from a faith perspective, it, this is about finding a way forward, not by trying to uh, figure out what is this judgment for. Ah, so not trying to put it in, put it in a place of this is because God is judging the gays again, um, which is pretty much every hurricane or earthquake. Yeah. That, every, that's the every, commentary. Was, right. Yeah. Uh, maybe this isn't about judgment as, a, as, as it is about opportunity. Mm. How, how can we be better people because of this? Right. Mm -hmm. um, so just very, very briefly, uh, a quick story. Uh, a little over two and a half years ago, I suffered a spinal cord injury, a oh, spinal cord bruise, that left me unable to use my right hand and my right arm for months. And it's taken me two years of intensive therapy and so forth to, to regain function and to, and there's still residual damage uh, from that. But one of the first things I began to ask myself 
as I felt sorry for myself in that moment was what is it I'm supposed to learn from this? How can I be a, I believe I'm going to get better. I don't know how much better, right? Uh, what is it that I need to carry forward beginning now to help me understand how to clearly things like this change us? Mm -hmm. Are they going to change you for good? Or are they going to change you for bad? Are mm -hmm. you going to become bitter through that? Or are you going to somehow be able to um, do something um, more positive out of that? Mm -hmm. So um, in, in my case, um, I reached the point where at the 18 month marker after my injury, when I felt like what well, the doctors were saying, whatever you have is what you're going to have, right? Uh, recovery wise. Mm -hmm. uh, and I wasn't where I wanted to be. And so I wanted to give myself some uh, permanent reminder that there was hope. And so I, I'm a writing coach. And when I teach writing, uh, you'll love this. Uh, I'm anti exclamation marks. Uh, people, <laughs> I'm all about the exclamation marks. I know. Marks. <laughs> people, people abuse the exclamation mark way too much. I'm and an I, abuser. I admit I, it. <laughs> I, uh, I quote a journalism professor who years ago taught his students, you have three exclamation marks for your entire life. Use them wisely. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, and so in my, in my case, um, I needed to find some way to put down a marker that I was going to look for what was right about my situation and not what was wrong. Okay. And so uh, maybe this will show up here. I have this tattoo. Of the three the exclamation marks. With my lifetime supply of exclamation marks right there. And you've used one now? Is that what you're saying? I what? Well, no, I've used all three of them. Okay. Right, to remind myself every day that I need to be thankful for what I have and not so worried about what I don't have. Okay. Recovery. And I think that's applicable in this time because um, it's so easy for us to be focusing right now on everything that's wrong and all the restrictions we have. And I mean, I go through this every day. I, I fluctuate from depression uh, to func well functioning like multiples. I, I like cycling through it every day as right. I think most of us are. But having yeah, and, a, and as a therapist, yeah, I want to validate that, that very much we need to recognize the grief cycle we're going through right now, which includes the anger, the depression, but also moving towards recognizing that each of these are valid and then being able to move forward. I think, yeah. So that was the whole point of this to say, mm -hmm. okay, this, this is on the arm that, that didn't work, right? Mm -hmm. this, is the, this is the arm that failed me and it still hurts. It's still stiff. I still don't have full use of it. But I put that marker there to remind me. And so I, I think during this time when we've got all these problems, let's not waste the opportunity, right? Uh, some people want to act like we'll get over this and we'll forget it ever happened. Mm. Well, please, no. <laughs> right? Uh, if that's the case, then I, I, I think we're foolish. We've got to remember what it feels like in this moment. So whether that involves journaling or uh, taking photographs or uh, r drawing pictures, whatever it is that works for you. Uh, I, I think there's therapy in sort of capturing the moment and how you feel right now, because that will help you down the road as well. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm thinking what I'm learning from this is what's really important to me and not to be so busy all the time. It's really helped me with my priorities about what's important. So yeah, I like that a lot. I like that. So, um, I want to move to the, um, the transgender community. You've got a TED Talk. You were interviewed by NPR. You're kind of seen as an anomaly in the pastoral community, which is good and bad. Wow. <laughs> because it's great that you're standing out um, and you're doing some things, but it's kind of a sad statement that not everybody is that way. Um, so tell me what happened. Tell me what made you stand out. Um, and, you're, and the TED Talk's amazing, people. You, you, you guys need to watch it. It is amazing. But um, go ahead and talk about that. Talk about what happened for you. Yeah, so our, our church um, in 2015 began a, what, what turned out to be a, an 18 month study on LGBTQ inclusion. Uh, we had been what I call a don't ask, don't tell church. Uh, we had uh, LGBTQ folks among us. Uh, we just didn't talk about it, you know. Uh, but there came a time when we sort of were forced to talk about it for several reasons. and. Uh, my book, uh, Why Churches Need to Talk About Sexuality, tells the whole story 
on that. But two quick things. We had a gay man who had, for five years running had been the most nominated person to become a deacon in our church. And we didn't know what to do about that. Deacons, oh. the, sort of the, the highest elected lay office in our church. Uh, we just didn't have a process to figure out, can we do that? Should we not do that? We, you know, because we don't talk about it, right? At the same time, um, within a two-year period, we had five kids who'd grown up in the church who were not the first to ever come out, but in this concentrated two-year period, these five kids who were children of the church, I mean, had grown up their entire lives here, either went off to college or graduated from college and were about to come back to Dallas, who came out as either gay, lesbian, or bisexual. And they would come to us and say, I really would like to come back to the church that raised me, uh, and I'd love to be involved. But if I do, would you welcome me now that I've come out? Would, could, could I be a teacher? Could I be a, a lay leader in the church? I would like to be. Uh, and we had to have some conversations to say, okay, in our, in our context, uh, we don't do infant baptisms, uh, but we do baby dedications. So uh, these kids all had been presented as babies in the church and had been walked around the sanctuary by our senior pastor in this litany he does where the congregation says, he asks, will you, raise this, will, you, will you help to raise this child and love him or her and nurture him or her and so forth? And we all say, yes, we will, right? Um, and the question those kids were coming back and asking is, did you really mean that? Hmm. <laughs> did you mean that regardless of who I turn out to be, you're still going to love me? welcome me and I'm going to have a place here. And so that sort of set all this up. And then the Supreme Court issued their ruling on same-sex marriage uh, in the summer of 2015, and that changed the landscape too. And so we had this study. In that study, uh, along the way, um, we, we finally reached this point. We had a 19-member study group that I was working with, and uh, someone said, look, we've talked a lot about the L and the G uh, in LGBTQ but we have not talked much at all about the B and the T. Mm -hmm. And so we had um, a geneticist on the study group and a pediatrician who does a lot of work in the LGBTQ community. And together they put together a presentation for us about what it means to be transgender. And they wrote up on this whiteboard all this stuff uh, about, you know, uh, biology and chemistry and chromosomes and brain cells and anatomy and just. My, I remember sitting there that Sunday afternoon, my mind was just blown. I, I, I thought, okay, I'm a pretty well-educated person. Uh, I pay attention to a lot of stuff. And why did I never know any of this before? Mm -hmm. How is it that I could be so ignorant about this? And so I'm a columnist for a national news service. And uh, that week, I just felt this compunction that I needed to write about this experience. So I wrote this column called Seven Things I'm Learning About Transgender Persons, which you can still find. It. Just If you Google my name, Mark Wingfield, and the word transgender, all this will pop up. Um, I wrote this column, and it went viral in 24 hours. Uh, it's been read by more than a million people now. Oh, wow. and, uh, and I wrote a follow-up column that also went viral. On, because what happened after that was I, I said in this column, I don't know any transgender persons but I want to learn. And all of a sudden, my phone started ringing, my Facebook messenger filled up, my email box filled up with all sorts of people contacting me to say, I heard you say, I, I read that you don't know any transgender friends. I'll be your friend. And so I started hearing from all these transgender folks and their family members who reached out to me, <laughs> right, with a hand of friendship. And I started going to coffee, and lunch and dinner, uh, having phone calls, uh, email exchanges. Over, over the next two weeks, I personally corresponded with 400, oh, 400 wow. people wow. who were either trans or the family members of trans folks. Mm -hmm. And mainly what I did was I listened. I listened to their stories. And in the follow-up piece I wrote, I, the, one of the key points I made was, I was shamed. I was stunned uh, at the pain, at the suffering, at the, uh, at the spiritual abuse almost every one of these people had endured, where they, they deeply wanted to be a person of faith. They wanted to believe. They wanted to live out of faith. And yet they had over and over again been rejected by a church. Even their family members had been rejected from churches because their child or their brother or their sister 
was transgender. It's not just the person, right? It's the extended family who gets thrown out uh, with really no even scriptural basis for this, um, which is another thing we could talk about. But over and over, the pain surfaced in this. And I just learned that the best thing I could do was listen. I needed to just shut up and listen. And when I did, I learned so much, um, I, not only about the biology and chemistry and so forth of uh, transgender uh, identity and gender dysphoria, but I learned a lot spiritually. Uh, I, I think one of the most important things any pastor can do is to have the humility to say, I don't know everything. There's a lot of stuff I don't know and don't understand. And if I would listen to you, maybe I can learn more about that. And so that led to the TED Talk. That led to all sorts of relationships that I keep up with to this day. Uh, I tell people th there is no other cisgender uh, pastor in America who knows more transgender folks than I do. Uh, and many of whom I count as friends, several as dear friends who I keep up with regularly. and my life is forever enriched uh, by that relationship and it just continues to play out it, there there's not a week goes by even today that i'm not hearing from someone uh, out of that uh, this this week alone i've been on the phone uh, twice for extended conversations with uh, transgender friends from two different parts of the country who needed some sort of spiritual advice or just wanted to tell me their story and one of them is a severely abusive situation. Uh, and you know, in that case, uh, this trans woman who has all sorts of interesting uh, parts of her story, I, at one point I said, she was telling me about something that happened that was really abusive. And I said, I'm so sorry to hear that. And she said, you know, don't be sorry. Uh, I am the person I am today because I have found a way through that. And yes, I wish it hadn't happened, but I'm learning from that too. And that's allowed me to be, this person to say, I've become the advocate. And then the other, the other person this week is an, an interesting thing because this is someone who grew up in an evangelical uh, Bible church context on the West Coast. Um, and now is, uh, a, has transitioned from male to female um, and feels a calling to serve like what we would say in our culture, calling to ministry, right? But yet it's trapped between two worlds because in a lot of the LGBTQ world where this person uh, finds friendship is so anti-church that when you say, I feel called to ministry, people are rejecting you from that side. And yet when she tries to go back to the Bible church world in which she was raised, to say, I'd like to go back to school and get a degree in Christian ministry as a trans woman. They say, well, you can't do that, mm. right? And so here's someone who's trapped on two sides of spiritual abuse, mm -hmm. right? From the, from the most progressive, supposedly, mm -hmm. and from the most unprogressive. Uh, mm -hmm. And she's trapped in the middle and doesn't know where to find safe harbor. Hmm. She can't find her safe place because it's so polarized. That's right that no matter what she says, it's seen by the other group as you're over here in these camps. She can't find that safe place. That's right. Wow. So um, what do you say to other pastors or ministers? I know your, your church had a vote um, of whether it was going to be supportive of the LGBT community, um, and you lost a lot of congregants over that vote. Yeah. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about that? And then how did you respond to people who were saying, oh, we shouldn't do this because they're against God and, and all this, they being the other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, our 18-month study process culminated in a congregational vote in November 2016. It was two Sundays that we allowed voting, and it happened to be the Sunday before and after the 2016 presidential election. Oh, my goodness. Oh, so, wow. um no stress in the air anywhere. Oh, okay. wow. <laughs> right. That's just, of course, when we set that date up, we had no idea how, how bizarre that whole time would be, right? And yet, that's where we landed. Um, so we had about 1,500 active members uh, at, at the time of the vote. Uh, some people had left along the way because they didn't like the fact that we were even talking. So the first wave of people we lost were people who said, we shouldn't even be talking about this at all. And so there's nothing to discuss. 
some of them had left early. Some had just sort of drawn away, but didn't, in our language, move their membership to another church because they wanted to be able to come back and vote against it whenever it, it, it came down to that. Mm. Uh, so th that's a whole political uh, thing. Yes, there are politics in the church. Um, so uh, the vote we actually had was, it was interesting because our bylaws had no restrictions on membership other than to say, if you're a baptized follower of Jesus Christ, you're welcome to be a member of the church. And so the vote we had was that we affirm our existing bylaws, that we will have one class of membership. And if you're a believer and a member of the church, you're in. Uh, there are no other distinctions. Uh, it's not that we have a second class, a first class and a second class membership. So if you're a member of the church and you're a baptized follower of Jesus Christ, you're here and you can be considered for any role based on your own merits, strengths, spiritual gifts. Uh, we're not going to put a litmus test up front on that. Well, the vote passed by a uh, 63% favorable uh, majority, which, you know, the, the, while that may sound like not as strong as you would think, it actually is very strong when you consider the differential between the, 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 the two numbers of the, of the for and against. And when you consider that people showed up to vote we hadn't seen in 10 years, uh, mm -hmm. because, you you know, when you're opposed to something, you rally the troops and literally bust people in to vote against it oh wow so, uh, we lost over the over the next few weeks and and months uh, about uh, 300 people out of 1500 um 70 percent of the people we lost were above age 60. wow over the two years that followed we gained 350 people and 70 percent of those were below age 60. And it's interesting, the people that we gained, obviously different, maybe not as steeped in church as the people we lost, but um, they were not just gay and lesbians and uh, bisexual and transgender folks. No, they were, they, were, they were all of those, yes, but they also have been people who just want to raise their kids in an inclusive community, mm -hmm. uh, an inclusive church. Um, who really sort of had to come check us out and see, is this the kind of place that you say you are? Um, and one of the things that we've learned most of all about welcoming uh, particularly LGBTQ folks into the life of the church is just because we say, everybody come, you're welcome here, doesn't mean everyone believes us. And so we've had a lot of folks come sit on the back row, uh, just sort of watch us for a while to see, are, are, we, are we who we say we are? right? Mm -hmm. uh, and how do we model that? that this has been a, an interesting challenge. One of my um, gay pastor friends in another state told me a year or so ago, uh, he, he had this instruction. He said, when I hear a sermon illustration in your church with a gay couple as a normative example of life, I will know that you're inclusive. Mm -hmm. You know, don't just say you're welcome. Talk about my life as well as, you know, don't let all the sermon illustrations be about white straight couples with two children, right? right. When, you, when you can talk about diversity of life and when you can demonstrate that, I'll know that you really are welcoming to me. And so these are things that we've got to think about, right? Because uh, when, when you come from a privileged majority position, it is hard to get your head around, how do I talk in a new way? Right. And that's one of the great things we've had to learn as we welcome new people into the church. Again, humility requires that you keep learning and you keep adapting. Uh, you and I talked the other day about my concern that in the COVID pandemic here, we might be losing the opportunity to welcome people into the church who might come check us out otherwise. And you had a really excellent point that I've been stewing on for days now uh, that no, actually this might be good, because with all the online things that we have going on now, people can check us out uh, without having to risk so much, right? And I hope that once we're all back together again, which surely someday, right? Maybe, we'll see. Uh, that that would pay off uh, in us then be beginning to have actual relationships uh, with people who've sort of been following along. And we're already seeing that to be true a bit. Uh, it's it's a really interesting time. Our numbers are up significantly in in video uh, views uh, mm -hmm. based on what our normal attendance would be, and so we know there are a lot of people around the edges. Uh, and the challenge is, how can we connect? Yeah, 
because that kind of happened around the 9-11 um, thing is a lot of people's church attendance kind of went up and then it kind of went down because yeah. they, they were looking for that connection. So it'll be interesting to see if they continue to connect with that um, and, and see that. So, so two comments I want to make. First of all, I know losing a third of your membership has to be really hard, especially if they're over 60, because that's, you know, that's a, a large monetary piece of but, your church um, in a very privileged area of Dallas. Um, so to say that we are welcoming and we are inclusive, that, that's a big statement to make. Right. Um, and I want to know, um, you're, you're talking about telling stories about um, a gay couple um, in church. What are the kind of things are you doing or have you decided to do to make it a welcoming place um, for LGBTQ and everyone who wants to raise their kids in an inclusive community? What other kind of things are you doing? Sorry, my lights went out again. Oh, okay. <laughs> I wave my arms. Here we are again. Yeah. Oh, good. Uh, yeah, it's just like, <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> you really are there. You do exist. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, 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 I stopped moving uh, for too long. Uh, so this, that's a really great question, and it's an evolving uh, answer, really. It, it's something that is not what, this is not something you say, we're going to make this tweak today, mm -hmm. and that solves this issue forever. Right. Because we're forever learning and adapting. Um, one of the things that we've had to do is learn to give people space. So uh, we're, we're a very engaging church. We have a very robust small group ministries, and we want people to get... Some of the normal things that we would do to say the, the steps into the church, in, you know, first you do this, and then you do this, and then you do this, and then you're in, and you know people. We want to make sure you connect with uh, enough other people. But not everyone wants that in the same way. And so we're having to leave room for people who want to come have one experience but not the full meal deal. Mm -hmm. you know, right? So maybe just coming to worship on Sunday morning is all they're up for right now. In the past, we would really hit pretty hard and say, well, but you'll learn so much more if you're in a small group and if you meet other people and, you know, come serve on a committee and uh, do these other things. And not everyone is really at the point to do that, nor do they want to. Mm -hmm. But we've had to figure out the way to be inviting to go deeper with, without requiring it or appearing to require it, right? How do we give you the space to do the thing that you're comfortable doing? Uh, while knowing all the time that you're welcome to take the next step with us, but we're not going to require it of you. Uh, per mm -hmm. se. And that's, that's a, that's a different thing for us uh, out of our context. We've had to adapt to what it means to be church uh, because the metrics that we previously used don't work anymore mm -hmm. because we count nickels and noses. That's what churches do, right? Uh, how's the offering and how's the attendance? Mm -hmm. And in the Baptist church, we, we count attendance in our Sunday school structure. Uh, and, and that's like the, the gold standard for everything. Well, that doesn't mean anything anymore uh, for us, uh, in part because attendance patterns have changed so people are in and out a lot more. Uh, but we also have folks who are coming into the church after either having never been in church or been away from the church for so long that they just don't have the habits that the folks we lost do, you know. The folks we lost were mainly here every Sunday. Right. I, I'm thinking the above 60, that it was the pattern of I go every oh, wow. Sunday. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, so you're allowing that space. Um, it, you're trying to increase the, the language and the conversation you're talking about. Um, talk to me about biblicism. You, you, um, you talked about that people are sometimes coming from churches where it, all answers are in the Bible. How are you kind of explain that a little bit. Yeah, so uh, biblicism is this idea that uh, the Bible is a flat text and every word is as authoritative as another word. Every, every chapter, every verse, they're all equal and they're all literal. And so uh, the, the, the way this gets expressed a lot in uh, Christianity is turning the Bible into an answer book. Uh, yeah, I, I, I've compared it recently to, if you remember the kids toy, the magic eight ball, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, where you have this black ball and you ask a question, does Susie like me, right? And you shake it up and you flip it over and uncertain. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. or, yes, but not now or whatever. And so a lot of people treat the Bible like a magic eight ball uh, that you'd sort of say, what is God's will for my life? Let me flip through the Bible and here's a verse. Or 
more uh, nuanced than that is to say, well, surely there's a Bible verse. If I just studied the Bible more, I would find the verse or verses that would guide me into this question. And so that's why people turn to religious authorities who, who've studied the Bible, right? And, and they'll come to someone like me and say, here's my dilemma. What does the Bible have to say to me? And I want to say, okay, um, let's ask, what does God have to say to you more than what does the Bible have? Because the Bible is one way God speaks to us. Uh, it is not the only way God speaks to us. And Biblicism says that the Bible itself is to be revered above God. Uh, so in our Christian context, it says uh, the Bible is more important than Jesus. Uh, we're going to worship the Bible as a text as much or more than we worship Jesus as a Savior, right? So that allows you to then think that any, any question you have about life uh, would be found in the Bible. An extreme example of that is when you try to turn the Bible into a science textbook or a history textbook. Mm, with the creation or, that, yeah. Right? Now you're back to the Scopes Monkey Trials uh, <laughs> and so many other things. That you, the, the Bible does not make those claims for itself. It's, it's, not, a, it's not a book you can index uh, like a, a do-it-yourself at home book, right? Where I'm, I'm looking for plumbing. Uh, how do I repair a leaky faucet? Mm -hmm. Go to this, this chapter and, and, and this verse. It's not like that, right? It's about relationship. We're back to that word. The Bible is a story that tells of God's relationship with humanity. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it is a narrative, not a textbook. It, it, mm -hmm. it is a story of love and redemption, not a how-to guide for everything that might come along the way. And so this, this fundamental understanding of what a spiritual text is uh, and I, I would say the same is true in other world religions that have sacred texts, mm -hmm. that none of them claim to be the definitive end-all guidebook to everything you ever wanted to do, right? Uh, so that, to me, that's the starting point uh, in this, is to acknowledge the limitations of, of what the Bible actually does. So I, I'm, I, I'm sitting here in my office at the church right now. And at this very table where I'm sitting, um, a couple of years ago, uh, there was a gay man who I had actually known in seminary years before um, when he was married to a woman and uh, before he came out. And he had gone off and served uh, a number of churches. But about seven or eight years before we were talking, he had come out and he lost everything. Mm. He, he lost his marriage. He lost his church that he was serving in. He couldn't find another church. Uh, he was working an hourly job at Walmart uh, at this point with a master's degree. And um, he came after, after our vote and found his way here, and we reconnected. And I never will forget, he sat here at this table, and he just he wept. And he said, I never thought I would find a church that would welcome me for who I am and yet still believe the Bible. Mm -hmm. Because in his experience, uh, if you're going to welcome him as a gay man, you had to throw out all of scripture, mm -hmm. right? The corollary to that is a, a middle-aged to early senior adult person during our study group who came to me one day and said, look, you're asking me to, to believe that what my parents and grandparents taught me about same-sex relations was wrong. And if I believe that, then what else did they teach me that was wrong? I can't pull that thread without undoing everything about my faith. It, mm. it, if you ask me to undo this one thing, to go back and say, well, there's another way to read those scriptures, there's another understanding of this, then everything else about my faith is going to come tumbling down. Oh, wow. The response is, man, that is a fragile faith. That's a house of cards. Right? You don't really have much faith at all. That's, that's not faith. That's fear, right? That's fear, yeah. And, and that's especially if you're saying... Especially if you're saying these few verses, you know, we could talk about the five clobber verses. If these five clobber verses could be read differently, that doesn't mean everything else is going to fall down. It just means we can read them differently. We can see. Right. Them I mean, otherwise you're playing Jenga, right? You pull what you pull the wrong plank, and everything comes tumbling down. I don't think that's what good faith is. Mm -hmm. So when people come to you with, um, and I imagine LGBTQ individuals come to you ho who have been just basically clobbered with these verses, what do you say to them? Do you say, 
let's read these differently or, or what oh, is- yeah yeah and fortunately there's some really great resources uh, out now some really fantastic resources um that we I, I like i keep a supply of several books on my shelf here okay what are they let's let's hear and, what uh, they are so, uh number one resource is uh, a book called god and the gay christian by matthew vines so god and the uh, gay christian god and the gay christian uh, matthew's a fantastic guy good friend now he uh grew up in um kansas uh presbyterian uh home went off to harvard as a freshman uh determined to come out, went back, uh, came out to his parents, and his father challenged him to say, okay, I will support you if you can prove to me from the Bible that it's okay to be gay. And so he took a summer and a semester off from school and went and did this extensive research on the texts and um, wrote this book that's been a best-selling book called God and the Gay Christian. And he's now uh, the head of an organization called the Reformation Project that seeks to uh, honor the Bible in an inclusive way in churches uh, uh, around the world. Uh, another great book uh, is uh, by my friend uh, Amber Cantorna, who's written a book called, um, it's called, it's, it's called uh, I'm looking at it right now. It's, it's, it's a guide to coming out for LGBTQ Christians. Um, Unashamed, I believe is the title of it. My, with my, uh, multifocal lenses i can't see across the office to the bookshelf okay but I'm pretty sure that, that that's what it is uh as well there's another great book uh by a guy named colby martin uh that's called unclobbered or unclobber and he takes those so-called clobber passages out of the bible that get used to clobber people over the head with you mm-hmm. know leviticus and romans and all this stuff and he unclobbers them uh, from a Christian theological perspective, a really great resource as well. Those are three that immediately come to mind. And I just, I'm, I'm recommending and handing those out every time I can. Mm-hmm. So that, that's got to be really helpful for people who are coming in looking for healing. That you right, because they, they, they need, uh, here, here's uh, the other way I would say this. People need to have language to be able to explain themselves. Okay. Uh, one of the things we learned out of our study is that a lot of people who want to be affirming and inclusive just simply don't have the right language to explain themselves. And so I say in my book that one of the things that drives people, the traditionalist, the way to drive a traditionalist crazy on this is to say, well, I don't really know why I believe this, but I just believe God wants us to love all people. Uh, and we, that's the thing we should do. But I, it's just, I feel it in my heart, you know? And to a traditionalist, that's like saying emotions you're, you're just depending on your emotions. There's no fact or reason in that, right? Uh, whereas what drives a m- more progressive crazy is when a traditionalist says, um, well, I'm not going to concern myself with my emotions at all. Uh, this is what I've been taught. This is what the scripture says. It's not up for discussion at all. Emotion be damned out of, out of mm-hmm. all, right? Well, maybe we can have both of those things in this as well. And so we've got to give people the language. Uh, and an easy illustration of this is that in talking with the transgender community, over and over and over again, I hear these stories about folks who knew when they were four, five, or six years old that they were not the person inside that they appeared to be anatomically on the outside or that their family told them they were. But they didn't have any language to describe. They didn't have words. They didn't have a vocabulary to do that. And I, I had a conversation with one person this week um, who really helped me understand the power of the internet for this, because th- this is someone who's in their mid fifties now. And when they were first dealing with this for many years, they had no access to books or anything to, to describe what, and they were afraid to mention it to anyone. But as the internet came along and they began to, to be able to search for keywords that describe what they were feeling, suddenly they found, wait a minute, there are other people out there who feel like I feel. Mm -hmm. and there's a word for this there's there's language for this and i can use this language and when we can name something we give it power right suddenly we have the ability to talk about this in a way and say i'm not just a vague concept that i can't explain but this is what i am this is how i feel and when you get that vocabulary going it makes such a big difference. And so one of the things that churches like ours have got to do is give people vocabulary. We've got to be able to have a conversation using these words that we're learning. 
right? Yeah, and it's also very validating. I know the internet for me was very validating to help me realize I'm not the only one feeling this way, that there are others. So it gave me language, it gave me perspective, but it's like, wow, I'm not the only one who oh, feels like I'm going right? crazy. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. So what question am I not asking you that you would just love to share with us? Oh, uh, the question you've not asked is, was it worth it? Okay, was it worth it? Was it worth it to lose 300 or 1,500 members? Right. Uh, to have people walk away who've been longtime friends? Yeah. Uh, to lose um, about $700,000 in annual funding? That's uh, huge. Right. Was it worth it? Every day, yes, it's worth it. What makes you say that? So the people we lost, while I'm sad most of them left, um, there are a hundred other churches in Dallas where they can go and find faith. Mm -hmm. The people we've gained in our part of Dallas, there aren't five other churches they could go to and be welcome in the way they are here. Mm -hmm. uh, and I will gladly stand at the judgment and accept that trade off that, that we had to lose some people who had a lot of options in order to welcome into the kingdom of God, other people who had no options right I, to me that's if that's not what the church is about then we need to close the doors right we if 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 we're about preaching and extending the love of god we need to provide access to that not exclusion to it mm -hmm. and so the relationships that we have developed from this the things i've learned the the friends i've made the the people who've changed my life uh i am a profoundly different person than i was three years ago Wow. And I would not trade it. Wow. Well, and just that 400 people reached out to you within that first week, um, wow. transgender, that really tells you that people are seeking spirituality and not finding that safe place to be able to experience it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, and I applaud you for that. That, that brings tears to my eyes just to think that somebody would be willing to do that sorry i'm a very emotional person yeah well it, it is emotional i i'm surprised i've gotten through usually when i tell this story i have to stop and cry several times <laughs> so, <laughs> sorry <laughs> yeah but as a pastor uh my gosh what could what could be better what could be better than building a new relationships like that and t having stories to tell that are that emotional right Right. And I think you're right, because here in Dallas, there's so many churches that they can go, those who laughed, and still feel welcome and still feel comfortable. But very, very few here um, that can feel welcome. And, and yours is one. And I know Cathedral of Hope is another one in Dallas. But it's just like you could name them probably just on one hand that are welcoming. Well, I want to add this to uh, one of the very first people to reach out to me and to reach out to us here at Wilshire after our vote was Pastor Neil at Cathedral of Hope. And for those who don't know, Cathedral of Hope is the largest uh, predominantly LGBTQ uh, church, uh, Christian church in America, and one of the oldest uh, as well, uh, really strong uh, congregation. And Pastor Neil has become a friend to both me and to our senior pastor, George Mason. And uh, he, he immediately reached out to us and he didn't have to do that. Mm -hmm. God knows churches like ours have driven people to his church mm -hmm. out of desperation. Yeah. And one of the most lovely things that happened two years ago was that we decided we would have joint services with them on uh, Holy Week. Oh, wow. So we welcomed Cathedral of Hope to our church for Monday, Thursday, and then we went over to have Good Friday with them. Oh, wow. And what happened on Monday, Thursday was all these members of Cathedral of Hope came over here, and for many of them who had grown up in a Baptist church somewhere else in Texas or nearby, and had been excluded from those churches, this was the first time they had ever stepped foot in a Baptist church again since their childhood. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And it felt so comfortable, and yet it was so scary, and yet it was so rewarding, and there were tears all around. And then Good Friday came, <laughs> and we went to Cathedral of Hope. And Pastor Neil introduced us, the Wilshire folks who were there, 
And everyone in that congregation gave us a standing ovation and applauded and applauded and applauded. Wonderful. And it was one of the most profound experiences of my life. And then um, at the end of that service, they have, a, they have a pattern where you leave the main sanctuary and you sort of go in procession over to their chapel for a, 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 a candlelit cross experience. And we, we all took our turns walking over there. And uh, there's a senior adult woman who's in the class I teach here at Wilshire, who's a good friend, who has a transgender child, adult child. And I was standing there as people were coming through and um, she, she came through the line on her walker. <laughs> and <laughs> she, uh, I went up to greet her and um, she, she held on to me and she said, I never thought I would live to see this day. Oh, wow. And I just began to sob. <laughs> <laughs> There, there was no holding back at that moment. And we just stood in that line in the, in the candlelit room and sobbed together for probably five minutes. Mm -hmm. um, it was one of the most moving experiences you can possibly imagine. Mm -hmm. She never thought, she, she's in her 80s. I never thought I'd live to see this day. Mm -hmm. Profoundly emotional about yeah. the connection yeah. and the relationship and, and finding that spiritual connection finally. So. Yes. Thank you for sharing that story. I, I really appreciate that. Um, wow. Um, anything else you want to say? Ashlyn, do we have any questions? Yes, we do. And um, I've been very emotional too through this. So thank you. <laughs> um, as someone who, um, you know, I'm from a really fundamentalist Christian background. Um, and someone who has just kind of started the process of coming out to family, to friends. Um, and that's been really, really hard. And so it has just been so refreshing to hear your perspective, Mark, on all this. I didn't, you know, there was a time where I didn't think that was possible for anyone um, in a role such as yours to broach the subjects like you have. So thank you so much for the work that you've done for people. It really means so much. Um, yeah, it really means yeah, so much. Absolutely. I, I have never seen someone in your role be so compassionate and welcoming. And so it is incredibly refreshing to hear that because I work with people in therapeutic relationships, but also my own personal experience. So it's, it's very refreshing to hear that. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Um, one of the questions that came through, um, Mark, is have you ever had experience working with the D-trans community? Um, perhaps, um, you know, because they're really isolated from everyone, um, their family, and perhaps even the trans community itself. Um, have they, have you found that they've detransed maybe not so much for religious reasons, but they feel it was the wrong decision? Um, have you had any relationships with people who've been through that? Um, just for the sake of all of us, would you like to define that a little bit more? D-trans. So someone who maybe went through the process of, um, you know, undergoing transgender and then decided this wasn't perhaps the right decision and has maybe reversed or have tried to reverse that. Um, does that make more sense? Yeah, I, think yeah. it's I just want to make sure everyone understands what we're talking about. Uh, yeah. Thank you for that clarification. There's so much lingo. Um, so uh, the the only experience I've really had uh, in that area is with folks who have begun to transition and for cultural or family reasons have had to untransition part of the time, mm -hmm. not because they changed their mind, but because uh, life circumstances changed. So uh, one, one of the trans folks that I've come to know uh, was a Southern Baptist pastor in Texas for his entire career as a male and after retirement transitioned, uh, finally felt the freedom to transition to female. Um, and her wife stayed with her mm. uh, through this, uh, which is another f layer of discussion uh, yeah. out of all this. Um, but they've got grandchildren, who are young grandchildren who don't understand what's going on. And just in the midst of transitioning, something happened with the extended family and they needed to provide regular daily care to those grandchildren in a way that they weren't able to, th this person was not able to keep transitioning at that moment. And it's heartbreaking 
right? Yeah. But, but I, the thing I, there's a side of me that from my privilege says, well, dad, gummit, you ought to just suck it up and, you know, educate those kids, right? But every family context is different. Uh, sure. And I can't dictate to your family system what's going to work there. And in their family system, this is what was necessary. And I think part of that's a bit of uh, uh, family sacrifice for a moment, right? It's not denying who you are, but it's saying for the sake of my grandchildren right now, I need to do this thing differently. And that's painful, right? But as far as anyone who's regretted what they've done and wish they could go back, in all the conversation, I know those people exist, but I have yet to talk to one. Mm. Hmm. It's interesting with my clients who are transitioning is mm -hmm. their parents will always bring up, you're going to regret it. You're going to detransition all of this. And it is like so many do. And they throw out these numbers like 80% detransition. And I, I don't think that's true. I, it's I not think true. It's yeah. And I, I think my sample is a pretty good sample. <laughs> right. And the <laughs> fact that I don't know a single person. I know. What? 400 plus? Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I know that I know this exists, but the the others will the critics will say, "Oh, there's some high number." Well, that's that's just wrong. Uh, there certainly may be some number, but um, on the other hand, I had a conversation this week with someone who was born a hermaphrodite, uh, legitimately, right, mm -hmm. uh, intersex, uh, and she was quoting to me a statistic that I need to go research, but I, she's researched it more than I has. I have to say that. In cases where the doctor, when a, when a intersex child is born, makes a decision one way or the other, we're we're going to make this child a girl or a boy. They get the they get it wrong eighty percent of the time. Mm. Mm. So I've read the same uh, thing. Yeah. So yeah. That. I'll throw that statistic back at you. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Thank you. Um, and this person who made the um, who asked the question. Um, also gave the comment, they said, there is a large com community of detransitioners, young women especially, um, up to 5,000. Oh. They should be welcomed and respected. Many experience isolation from the trans community, family, and church. Um, oh, absolutely. I, I think that's a wonderful point. And again, there, there's another learning edge for us, right? Sure. Uh, sure. Yeah, Thank you. you can get you can give that invitation out for people to contact you so you can have some deep yeah, friends. I, yeah, I'd <laughs> like to hear from some of you because that, yeah. that that has not been part of my experience, and I would love to learn what that's about. Sure. Thank you so much for answering that. Yeah. Uh, someone made a comment. They said, "Yes, thank you for talking about the transactional nature of some religions. My past transactional religion carried over into my relationships with others." Since recognizing that, I have had a much better relationship with God and others. Thank you. Wonderful. That's a very kind comment. Thank you. Someone said, my dad is the pastor of the high demand group that I left, and he's still very much a fundamentalist. Right now, he's still open to staying in touch with me, but I'm afraid that if I come out, that he and the rest of the community will reject and shun me. There is previous history of this group being hostile towards ex-members who come out as gay. I don't want to lose my family, but I can't continue to live not embodying who I am. What advice do you have for me? <laughs> That's a big question. Yeah. Um, so it's certainly a heartbreaking situation. Yeah, it, it, it is. Um, so I think the best advice I can give is to connect with other people who've been in your shoes uh, and to hear their stories and learn from them. Uh, there's, there's no substitute for firsthand experience. Uh, and I mentioned um, a, a friend of mine earlier who has two books out, who I, I just would highly recommend. Uh, her name is Amber Cantorna, C-A-N-T-O-R-N-A. -A. Um, hang on, I'm gonna grab a book right here. I, love uh, I, mentioned, I mentioned this earlier. This is her book, Unashamed, um, a coming out guide to, for LGBTQ Christians. Her first book is titled um, Refocusing My Family. 
uh, <laughs> and it's the one that's going to be relevant here because her father is a a high level executive with focus on the family, James Dobson's organization. Oh, wow. Uh, well, as soon as you said that, I was like, oh, focus on the family? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a similar. So her, her book is titled Refocusing. My wow. Family. Wow. Her, okay. her story is about um, being rejected by her, by her family who chose following James Dobson and his teaching over their own daughter. And uh, she actually is married now uh, to another woman, uh, lives in Colorado still, and uh, I think has not had contact with her parents uh, for six years now. Wow. So I imagine he has a story to tell, like, right? Yeah. And connecting with these kind of people who've walked it is the best way to do it. Uh, I don't have this lived experience. Mm -hmm. I can tell you stories about people I've met along the way, and that might just be a starting point. But to really talk to other people who've been on the journey is the best way to do it. Yeah. Thank you very much yeah. for that. And thank you for sharing. Um, and I'm so sorry that you're in that situation um, with your family. It's horrible. Yeah. Um, I have another question that came through here. Um, what advice would you give to people, Mark, and perhaps Cindy too, um, from a mental health perspective of people who've walked into a church um, who are LGBTQ, who have not um, who have been, you know, perhaps met with hostility or have been really traumatized or triggered from their experience in that church. Um, what would you, what advice would you give to them on how to recover and how to move forward? You want to start, Mark? Oh, no, you go ahead. I've talked enough. <laughs> well, from, a, from a therapeutic um, perspective, when I'm helping people um, come out of abusive churches or cults and they want to reconnect with spirituality, um, I definitely tell them, um, we, we have the conversation about what are you looking for and to take their time. I had one woman who took five years to find a place that she felt safe and she actually found it after two years and it was putting her toe in, her toe out and um, just taking her time to talk to people. She found it like two years later, but then she spent three years testing it, trying it out before she felt comfortable and and really she had to come to a place to trust that what she was feeling was real because she didn't trust her feelings she didn't trust uh, at you know the, the charismatic leader she didn't trust answers and so it took a long time so time patience checking it out that's really the perspective i go from what do you think mark yeah and and we actually had a good conversation about this uh, a few months ago that was very helpful uh, to me um, because one of the dangers is someone who has been in an abusive spiritual relationship can simply trade one abusive relationship for another. Exactly. When you get conditioned to need that kind of thing. Uh, it, it's like someone who gives up drinking to only start smoking. Mm -hmm. right? uh, you, you haven't really dealt with the base issue. You've just changed the substance of it. And I, this is why I think we see uh, people who leave one abusive religion ultimately often end up in another abusive religion. And uh, you know much more about that than I, than I do, but I, I can validate that uh, is, is certainly true. There's some, we got to somehow break the cycle, right? So there's a deeper issue uh, that it's not really religion per se, it's the need for certainty. Right. And, and it feels familiar. And so instead of recognizing what was wrong with the first one, it's like, Oh, I, this feels familiar. I, I need support. And so they move just from one. Yeah, it's familiar. Just, I, I, I need that comfort of someone controlling me. Right. It's, it's almost like the domestic violence kind of moving from one abusive relationship to another without taking the time to go, what do I really need? What do I need to rethink, recalibrate within oh, myself? Yeah, that's true. That's very true. Yeah, I, I will say as a pastor, uh, trying to work through the years with um, individuals in abusive uh, marital family relationships, mm, mm -hmm. my success rate in getting people to leave those families is zero. Yeah, it's, it's not high. Yeah, it, it takes about um, eight to 10 times for somebody to leave an abusive relationship 
before they actually leave leave and the sad thing is is sometimes it it ends up in um death uh because they can't get out of it it's it's yeah. a horribly abusive cycle so and i think i think abuse of religion is that i mean it's the same mo mm -hmm. i agree i agree thank you thank you thank you both for answering that Oh man, this has been just such an emotional and informative um, interview. Um, I just wanted to thank you both so much again for spending some time um, participating in this series, um, or Cult Recovery Not Canceled. Um, it's just, uh, it was, I loved um, your transparency, Mark. I loved um, just hearing, um, I love how we incorporated, you know, we've done a lot of the mental health, you know, um, highlights. And so it was really cool to incorporate someone on the spirituality um, side of things to come into this discussion. So thank you very much um, for joining us today. Sure. Yeah, Mark, um, you did an awesome job. Thank you so much for being transparent and willing yep. to share. Appreciate it Thank very you. much. And uh, I, I will say, if you'd like to read more of, of what I've written about any of this, uh, mm -hmm. including my personal journey with the spinal cord injury, um, as well as my advocacy in the LGBTQ community, uh, my website is mark-wingfield.com. You got to add the hyphen in there. There's another Mark Wingfield who's a jazz guitarist in London. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's not good. And I want you two to know, um, we put your personal bios and information in the chat for attendees at the beginning of the session. So, um, you know, it's there. Um, also, attendees, if you have any questions as a follow-up to this discussion today, feel free to send me an email um, and I can get it to Mark or Cindy or you can contact them directly, I'm sure. Um, yeah. We would love to make sure and get your questions answered. I wanted to just real quickly promo tonight's talk. Um, it's at 8 p.m. Eastern time with Eva Mackey, who's an MD. She'll be talking about the challenges of parenting after the cult. Um, and it should be a very, very interesting discussion. So please join us tonight if you were able. Um, and yes, Cindy just put your- um, Is it a dash or an underscore? It's a dash. Oh, it is a dash. Okay, that's what I put yeah. it in. Yeah, that's it. Great. Yeah, okay. Thank you. And thank you too again so much. And sure. if you guys want to see more of Mark and Cindy, come to the Dallas conference. In <laughs> yes! Yes! Come yes. to Dallas sometime yes. September, October. We'll figure it out. <laughs> it works. And if we need to postpone further, you know, we'll, we'll, I'll meet you guys and I'll meet you in person, Mark, eventually. So okay. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Thank you yeah. so much, Ashlyn, for doing thank all you. of this. You're thank amazing. You.